Who likes macaroni and cheese? I do. <laughs> that's what I thought, approximately everyone. So that's important for understanding life in, on other planets, and I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. I'm Luke McKay, and I'm a scientist trying to figure out how life began here on Earth. And to do this, I get to explore some of the most extreme ecosystems, and I search for modern day relatives of our oldest ancestors. The really cool thing is, if we can understand how life began here on Earth, it gives us a better idea of where to look for life on other worlds. A few years ago, I found myself 6,604 feet beneath the surface of the ocean, peering through the tiny window of a three-person submersible called Alvin, at white octopuses, spiked crabs, five-foot-long worms, and massive shaggy carpets of colorful bacteria. At these pitch black depths, the water outside of the sub was nearly freezing, but mere inches into the sea floor and the mud was hotter than boiling. I was there to capture and study the incredible life forms that thrive within the hot mud in a seemingly deadly environment, the magnificent microbial world of extremophiles. Extremophiles are microscopic organisms that happily live in conditions that we humans would consider hostile to life. But as you probably know, they're not just at hydrothermal vents on the sea floor, they're also right around the corner in the hot springs, geysers, and even at the bottom of the lake in Yellowstone National Park. At Montana State University, I examine the DNA of these creatures and the chemistry of their environments to better understand how they survive. Now you may have noticed that the ecosystems I research have something in common. They're very hot. I focus on these sites because it is likely that four billion years ago, life began in a hot environment. It turns out that the heat trapped inside of our planet is associated with chemical energy. And this chemical energy escapes through cracks in the Earth's crust. Extremophiles congregate at these cracks for access to this chemical energy, which is essentially the willingness of molecules to get rid of their electrons. That is chemical energy, and that is precisely why extremophiles live in hot environments, for access to electrons. This may have been the only way to live four billion years ago when our planet was young and conditions were very harsh. I'm here today to paint a picture of how through the movement of electrons, every single type of life on our planet exists. We are all at the most fundamental level, never-ending electrical circuits. And without this movement of electrons, life as we know it could not exist. Now it may sound far-fetched, but I truly believe that understanding this idea and its implications has the ability to bring people together. I mean, who hasn't thought, why are we here? Okay, so, the Earth has changed a lot in four billion years. Life is no longer restricted to terrifyingly hot environments, but now occupies more comfortable electron-harboring habitats all around the globe. For humans, what keeps us alive is food like a delicious steaming bowl of macaroni and cheese. Because food is great at getting rid of electrons. You can think of mac and cheese as our hot deep ocean vent. It is our electron source. And we breathe oxygen, which happens to be excellent at stealing electrons. So electrons actually move from mac and cheese to oxygen but they use our bodies as a conductor, just like plugging a lamp into an outlet. Once we plug in to the outlet between food and oxygen, electrons course through us, providing the literal power for life. But life is diverse, and using food and oxygen is not the only way to live. This image represents the most up-to-date understanding of the overall diversity of life on our planet. This is our tree of life. When two branches on this tree are very close together, 
that means the DNA of those two organisms is not actually that different. So as indicated by Beyonce, here we are. <laughs> but how does everyone else live? Elephants, praying mantises, sea anemones, for example, they each live the same way that we do. They get their electrons from food and they move their electrons to oxygen. And this is where they're located on the tree of life. Tulips, carrots, and palm trees, they do things a little differently. They get electrons from water, and with the help of the sun, they move those to carbon dioxide. And this is their position on the tree of life. Even an oyster mushroom only gets us to here. Animals, plants, and fungi seem so diverse, but according to their DNA, they only represent this tiny fraction of life on Earth. Now, when we add some examples from the microscopic world of life, that's when things start to get interesting. Let's just name a few together. Are you ready? Anamoxiglobus propionicus, Thiomargarita namibiensis, and my personal favorite, Methanothermobacter thermotrophicus. <laughs> Despite their annoyingly long names, these are the organisms that perform all sorts of really cool electron transfers. These particular microbes get their electrons from ammonium, sulfide, and hydrogen, and they move those electrons to nitrite, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. And that's just three examples. Many other microbes might use manganese or iron or sulfate. The list goes on. The point is twofold. The diversity of life on Earth is mind-bogglingly vast, but so are the different combinations of molecules for moving electrons around. Life has figured out so many different ways to do this based on virtually every type of chemistry in every imaginable environment. From the extremophiles that first did this four billion years ago, by dancing dangerously close to the Earth's fiery interior, to we modern humans who love macaroni and cheese. In light of this, consider the vastness of space. Conservatively, our sun is one of 100 billion stars in our home galaxy, the Milky Way, which is one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Multiplying those together, gives us an estimated 10 sextillion stars in the known universe, or a one with 22 zeros behind it. Now, if we say that only 1% of those stars have planets revolving around them, and only 1% of those planets are even in a zone that could potentially harbor life, that still equals one quintillion stars that might be out there providing light and warmth to livable planets, or a one with 18 zeros behind it. And even if we say that life is an improbable feature, and there's only a one in a million chance that one of those planets will have life, that still equals one trillion planets with life in the universe. But the thing is, planets are made of molecules, and molecules have electrons, that can be moved around in so many different ways to support life. Y'all, we are almost certainly not alone. Why is everyone not freaking out about how cool that is all the time? <laughs> Imagine the discovery of other life with respect to our own diversity. Do they laugh and cry? Do they have different languages and cultures? Do they have music? Who is their Beyonce? <laughs> For me, just the simple prospect of life elsewhere instills an overwhelming sense of kinship with the entire human race and even with other organisms. On a superficial level, we may seem so different from each other, but we are the living beings of Earth next to the sun in the Milky Way. And we are alive because we have plugged in to our planet. Where else has life formed an electrical circuit? Thank you. Thank you.